When firefighters arrived at the Clancy home in Duxbury on January 24th, they had no idea what they were walking into. Patrick Clancy only said that his wife, Lindsay, had fallen from a second-story window when he called 911. Now, we know all too well what he and the firefighters saw when they went inside to check on Clancy's three young children, who were all unconscious with visible signs of trauma. Five-year-old Cora and three-year-old Dawson would end up being pronounced dead at the hospital, and eight-month-old Callan died of his injuries three days later. Lindsay Clancy, who is still recovering from what we now know was her jump out of that two-story window, now faces murder and strangulation charges for her children's deaths. The tragedy has sparked conversations about mental health care for new mothers like Lindsay, who reportedly was among the almost one in five parents who suffer from maternal mental health conditions before or after giving birth every year in the U.S. Now, the fire chief who responded to the call is hoping it will also draw attention to the mental health struggles of first responders. Chief of the Duxbury Fire Department, Rob Reardon, joins me now, and we should mention his spouse as part of the Greater Boston team. Chief, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, talk to me about what your reaction for yourself and for your team and other first responders was after responding to this incident. This was a highly unusual incident, uh, more tragic and traumatic than, than the average call that we respond to. And um, we immediately saw that, that our responders needed help. Um, so we activated a critical incident stress management team and um, immediately upon return um, had them talk to people, people to help them through this. Many of folks who work as first responders um, will tell you uh, that they're trained for a lot of things and also the day that you interact with them is usually one of the worst days of your life. You know, right? Absolutely. You're making calls when people are in distress. Right. Sometimes it's a cat up a tree, and other times it's a horrific, terrible incident. So a certain type of person signs up for this job. Um, what kind of mental health support and community support um, do first responders generally get when they're answering a call of this magnitude? I think it varies on, on maybe where you work in your organization. And to be honest, I don't know that there's a roadmap for this. We train to put out fires and we train to treat people. But I don't know that we train to treat ourselves and to help our, our people that work for us. And so that night, we, we basically um, we needed to come up with a way to help them. And that's what we did. We activated the teams to come in and basically give them and their loved ones the resources that they needed to help heal. One of the things uh, that's a positive of social media is uh, people can connect on it that are having um, tough times or good times. Have, have other fire departments, other first responder departments reached out to you from hearing the news that your team um, answered this terrible call and the steps that you've been taking to make sure people are getting support? Sure, it's been unbelievable. We've, we've received emails, texts, phone calls from not only around the country, but the world, as far, far away as the UK. But one of the calls that we received, I received directly through social media, was a contact from Boston Fire asking if we needed some help and if we wanted to use their critical incident stress management team. And we took them right up on the offer. And they immediately mobilized a team and got them down to Duxbury. And not only did we offer that to our Duxbury firefighters, but we also offered it to our surrounding towns. So Marshfield and Pembroke and Kingston and Hanson, the other firefighters who also responded. And they did tremendous things for us. It was, it was unbelievable what they did. What are some of the things that they did? Well, in order to heal, you, you need people with credibility and people who have unfortunately seen horrible things themselves. And those were the people that, that came there and, and were able to talk to us and they set up a, a diffusing, they set up a debriefing. And honestly, they came down every day for a week just to spend time with our members, just to talk. You know, they've been here before. They've, they've had some tragedy in their department before and they were tremendous to lean on. And that just shows you the brother and sisterhood. Just because they're the biggest fire department in Massachusetts, you know, they, they gave us so much um, that we honestly, um, we, I don't know how we'll ever repay it. Do you feel that, that, that there's a network now set up? I mean, you know, it's a small fire department that you have fall, a, a small uh, emergency responder, but obviously Boston's big, but all across the country, there are tons of small and rural right. firefighter department and EMTs. Is, is there a network set up for this sort of critical response when, when, when you need help? Well, luckily Boston 
open that network up for us. And um, I, I just hope through this, other departments learn that there are resources out there. Um, you just have to reach out and ask. And that's, luckily they reached out to us to give us a hand right at the start of it. And uh, we were able to get resources mobilized and the, the resources haven't stopped. I want to show some uh, statistics, some sobering statistics for us, for uh, some numbers from 2017 through 2021 of firefighters who uh, died from suicide, firefighters and EMS workers. These numbers are from the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. Uh, and obviously it's a tragedy every time someone takes their life via suicide. I come from a generation of uh, my family who were in uh, first responders, fire department, police department. Not a lot of talking about the things that they saw and sometimes, frankly, some substance abuse and other behaviors that as we know, are cries for help when you're suffering with mental health challenges or with trauma that you've seen. How do you change the culture uh, in firefighting, in the police departments, that when someone wants to ask for help or a department wants to ask for help, the culture is there to support them to do it? Well, that first night when Boston Fire came in, one of the first things they said is, it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay to reach out for help. And they made it all right to open up. Um, and I think people have to understand that, you know, that all these calls affect us differently. Um, and we can't let a stigma get in the way. We have to be open to this. And um, that's what I think has helped us so much. You see it more um, than others do. And one of the, the, the harsh realities, I think, post COVID is the number of the amount of help we need and access to mental health care for everyone and the lack of availability for it. And I imagine there are a number of calls that your department makes that are mental health related and not necessarily fire related or um, health emergency related. Are, are you feeling satisfied that you get the amount of training that you need and your, 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 your department gets the training in order to adequately answer those calls? We do. Um, we have our firefighters that have attended specialized training, and um, I think it's imperative. We have to. Um, mental health cases are increasing across the United States, and we're not exempt from that. When you get um, a call, we talked about this uh, before we came out onto the set. Um, there's so many areas of response that happens when someone picks up the phone and calls 911. Right. And one of the challenges, I have friends who work in the 911 world, and they often tell me how, um, how anxious they get that they never know how the call turns out. Right. Sometimes they do if it's a tragedy, right. but regularly they don't. Sometimes they don't know if it's a big deal or a small deal. Sure. Um, what kind of camaraderie can, can we as a general public help encourage and support to everyone who is working uh, in the first responding uh, world? I think this case highlighted a little bit of that. So we have dispatchers that work out of our fire station. We have a uh, regional dispatch system uh, that dispatches six police and six fire. Um, so that night when this happened, we brought them right into our defusing, and, we, and the police were offered it too. But there's, this affected so many people. This wasn't just our dispatchers, our police and fire. You have to start thinking about state police and those crime scene involved, and there's nurses and doctors, and the, it. It's, it's like that onion that just keeps getting better. There's so many layers. And then there's people who weren't even there that were affected and feel guilty because they weren't there to help. Um, and that's what you have to think about. This is, there's just so many layers to something like this. And the families. And the families. Your families, Absolutely. the first responders' families, are they getting the kind of support that they need as well? So one other great resource Boston Fire helped us with is, is we brought our spouses in and we did a spouses night. And uh, this was a night where we basically helped them no, like you should you should be watching your loved ones and, and you're the first one who might notice that you know something isn't right but also for them as as wives and husbands of first responders what you what can, you can do to, to help yourself out and there was support for them because a lot of times we forget about them um, but this is more than just our firefighters this is this is a whole family so we try to approach it with the Boston fire team to support all of our families so for the big institutional change to make sure that first responders get the mental health support that they need, both whether it's actual therapy or just time off. What can we do as citizens? Is it a call to our town managers, uh, to our city managers, to our mayors? Is it keeping an eye on the unions to make sure that they are advocating for first responders to make sure the protections happen when you need them? I think 
I think it's really just education. Um, I, the town of Duxbury has been amazing from management, union, everything. Everyone's trying to do the same thing here, and that's basically protect our members and uh, get them better and help them heal. So w we've seen just a, a everybody come together, which, which is amazing. Well, Chief Rob Reardon, I appreciate your service. I appreciate what you're doing to keep everybody safe and healthy. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me.